5,000 worked in the community over the last 20 years with guys who use violence against their female partners uh, and their children. And for much of that time, um, so, and those men are, are often mandated to be there, but there's also vol uh, volunteer uh, men as well. For much of that time, we've, um, it's mo been more recent that I've actually been using um, restorative justice as a language to describe my work and practice, but really it's resonated quite, uh, quite loudly with me as, um, as, as I've learned more about it with really work that we've been doing for about the last uh, 15 years at uh, this community organization. So we work with both the men and their families. And this approach to, a uh, restorative approach to working with intimate partner violence has really been developed with a number of people, uh, Marilyn Burwash Brennan at Bridges, Jane Donovan at New Start, and more recently um, cultivating these conversations in the violence against women community with um, uh, Pamela Harrison, uh, head of the shelter movement um, fans. Uh, for a number of years, and also for a singer. So I just wanted to do a shout out to them. In terms of my own work, I initially was trained with Ellen Pence in uh, Duluth, and uh, that work remains still uh, very valuable to me. I get pulled into um, narrative therapy circles with uh, Alan Jenkins and Michael White, so that was another influence uh, in the work that I'm going to describe a little bit today. And then more recently, I've been introduced to uh, Jennifer Lewin's work around restorative sort of justice, and that's really been helpful in pushing the work even further. I'm going to talk about a little bit. One of the places that um, that the restorative justice lens has given me is to really, <clears throat> for me to reconsider what I think about justice. I think uh, for years I've kind of conceded justice to something lawyers were doing. I have two siblings that are lawyers, so I'm going to bash them a bit, but yeah, I'm close with lawyers. Um, that uh, restorative justice, it was, or the justice was something that was happening in, um, in the Department of Justice. And more recently, as I've been thinking about how to like define justice and thinking about ideas of, well, maybe we could be thinking, rather than prosecution, pro arrest, and so forth as justice, uh, that we could actually be thinking about uh, the, the healing and repair of the harms that have happened. Maybe, maybe I could be thinking about that as justice. And when I start to think about that as justice, really many of my colleagues and, and restoring values around safety, quality, respect. Many of my colleagues and I have been working on that project for a long time. The shelter movement has been working on trying to restore women's safety and respect and integrity and equality for a long time. So it made sense to me if I, if I could loosen up this de definition of justice and pull it away from the Department of Justice only and think about actually the work that we might be doing to try and help um, work with women in a way that was repairing and healing the harms. But in fact, maybe justice is happening in our offices, in our community um, centers. So I want to be clear, just as I walk a little bit down the road, I'm just obviously going to be talking about a bit small sliver of the practice that we, um, that we do. Uh, but I, I want to be clear that um, I'm not talking about restoring intimate relationships when I'm talking about restorative justice and intimate partner violence. I'm talking about restoring equality, safety, repairing harms. So again, the relationship may be over, but a guy can still take responsibility to repair the harms that, that, that he's created. So it's not, it's not dependent on that coming back. And that those can be very meaningful conversations for a guy to take responsibility in front of his ex-partner or his partner around taking responsibility. It's not dependent on necessarily them uh, continuing the intimate relationship. I also want to be clear, I'm not talking about putting all these people in a room together, necessarily. Some women may want that, and it may be safe, and the workers think it's a good idea, and so forth. But that's, it's not, um, it, I, I think it was sort of justice, again, as a lens, as a theoretical framework. The actual practices are going to be very dependent on all the people involved in the particular situations. So some women will, uh, that'll be a good idea, and some women that will not be a good idea. Um, and at the same time, even if there's not that conversation together, that, can, that restorative sensibility remains important to me and uh, to the work. And I'm also not uh, trying to take um, incarceration or incapacitation off the table, too through restorative justice, we still need processes that if a guy is not going to take responsibility, that we can still create safety in our community for those you know, uh, who have been harmed. So I just want to be clear about that. 
One thing, if we can go to that, so I just want to give you a little bit of an overview, a slice of the practice of working with men. So within this organization, there will be people working with women and, and working with the men primarily. I'm going to be talking about guys who use violence against their female partners. That's primarily the configuration I work with. There's lots more complexity to, to, to that um, that I wish I had more time to unpack. But why don't we go to the next slide? Or is that, is that up to me? Okay. Um, so in terms of, uh, just to uh, give you a brief overview of this process of working with a guy and uh, how we've slowed this down. To be clear, there's a moratorium in Nova Scotia in terms of just the Department of Justice not working on um, intimate partner violence or um, sexual violence. It makes sense to me why that moratorium is in place and the concerns that we have around that. This, so this restorative approach has really been developed outside of that right in the body of the community. So what I have here is I'm starting with A. So there's a process here of kind of moving up. Um, <clears throat> the first part is about working with a guy separately from his partner without any contact. And it's not just working with the guy, it may be also working with his surrounding community or men in groups. And so the part A of this process is, again, starting from the bottom, what part of what restorative justice allows is more robust understanding of what take responsibility might look like. So parts of that, I will work with the men individually first before they ever get any contact formal, and the, con and the contact may be face-to-face, -face, but again, there's many other ways contact could happen, which I'll explain. So the uh, ground level here is acknowledging the abuse as part of taking responsibility, and, and um, the next part would be a uh, plan to stop the abuse, so what's the man's plan, and we've got to develop that all before there's any contact. Get him to engage and study what the effects are of the abuse, and then upon studying the effects, then looking at, well, what a healing and repair look like in this process. What, and that, those will be conversations about restoring values and, and uh, transformation and so forth. As I move through that process, then for some guys, we'll move on to having some kind of contact, either through social workers, through video, through in-person, or whatever the woman feels is a good idea, and, and the workers involved think is a good idea. Then the contact, I would be moving through those stages again, where um, he's actually acknowledging the abuse in front of her, that he's sharing a plan uh, with her about what his plan is to stop the abuse, to sure it doesn't happen, sharing with her and hearing from her about the, what he thinks maybe the effects are, and she'll be also able to speak to those effects, and then looking at issues of healing and repairing the effects. So that's a general overview of the process. And I just want to slow it down a bit in terms of uh, looking at the importance of the, some of the work that we do before we would ever have any contact. So the acknowledgement of the abuse, of course, many of the men who come, in, <clears throat> who come into the process are ambivalent at best about actually showing up. And so there's a lot of minimization of the seriousness of abuse and denying it or blaming it on other people. So I don't want to have that, those issues worked out in front of a woman. I want to work with that before he ever gets, because I find if the, the situation where she is, if, she, if we didn't do that work of him really acknowledging uh, you know, that he did it and this is a problem, and uh, studying the seriousness of it, that if that doesn't, doesn't happen, it sets up a situation where, of course, she's trying to convince him of the seriousness of what he's done. That's not a very satisfying experience for, for many women to be in that position, where they're trying to convince him that this is what happened and this is what my experience was. And with him denying and minimizing that, that's not going to be helpful. So, again, working with the guy to um, push through that and, and towards that acknowledgement uh, is important before he would ever have contact. Then looking at a plan to stop the abuse, so that the guy works out a plan, he's gonna consult with her through this process, that'll be the second stage, but we, I, he needs to take responsibility to be thinking about this himself. He needs to come up with a plan, how he's gonna slow down, study some of the warning signs and so forth for how to stop his violence, and to, uh, and to have some sense of what he needs to stay, what values he needs to stay connected with, so we can interrupt that. Uh, then we're also going to have him uh, look at the, invite him to consider what her experience might have been like. So this becomes a really important part of the process, not as a substitute for listening to her or hearing from her, but part of what I want to work through is um, that the guys are kind of put, trying to put themselves in their shoes so he's not in front of her being defensive or saying you don't need to feel that way, you shouldn't feel that way, that's not what I meant. All that kind of stuff I find very not healing, not repairing. 
if he still hasn't really kind of put himself in her shoes before he gets into the context with her. Often guys are thinking in the beginning stage that, you know, she's going to be really happy that I changed and there's going to be like, you know, some congratulatory response from the partner. Often that's, you know, I mean, partners are often happy that he's changed, and, but that's usually not what they lead with. What they lead with is their best awe and they're very angry that they've lived with this. And I want to make sure the guy, before he ever gets a, a, a reasonable contact with her around these issues, that he can absorb that. That he gets that that's probably important. That he gets what the values are that are, that anger is connected to. And that fact that she is thinking that her anger stems from wanting to stand up against violence. And the injustice has played out in their relationship. And that he might be able to see in her anger the same values that he's trying to take a stand for now as he's trying to take responsibility. Um, and then looking at feeling and repair the effects of the abuse. Um, so we'll get him to think about, of course, she needs to be asked what's going to be helpful here, but also what needs to happen is he needs to be thinking about that first. It's not going to be good enough for him to and go up in the room, or go into the room and say, what do you want me to do? Like it's just her problem, the burden's on her to come up with how to fix all this stuff, that she'll actually be consulted. Then the guy would come, but then upon kind of laying this foundation, then there may be some contact created where he's acknowledging the abuse. And these are often for women to actually get to, so I'll, I'll have conversations with guys taking responsibility in front of her. And for the women who get the opportunity to hear the guy who is blaming her say that, you know, to have guys say, no, I was blaming you for the violence and that was wrong. I know that probably made you feel crazy to think that I was blaming you for the violence. I mean, we've been trying to convince women for years that you're not to blame, you're not to blame. But to actually have the guy say it to her who was doing the blaming of her is often very powerful for women, very important that they have access to that. Also, in terms of acknowledging the abuse, we can go through that process. Or looking at uh, him sharing the plan to stop the abuse, that'll be also part of it. Just want to finish. And then uh, <clears throat> the. the um, also looking at not only healing repair in terms of the relationship, or, or, the, or in terms of healing repair, the effects on the woman, but also uh, the children and so forth. So there's a lot more of those conversations. Maybe we'll get to unpack them tomorrow. I just want to draw your attention to the pamphlets that, that uh, we put on the table, just in terms of as an example. It's a documentary that I've been involved with, and it's going to come up next year, and I just want to uh, footnote it as it was a woman who had been beaten up by her husband, or by her partner for two years, and 20 years later she met him on the streets of Toronto, and she told herself at that time, if I ever see him, I'm gonna ask him if he'll let me interview him on, on the camera about our relationship 20 years ago. Meanwhile, during that 20 years, she had joined the Batter Women's Movement, she said post-traumatic stress, she couldn't sleep, she carried all that tension with her, and so lo and behold, she did meet up with him again, and he agreed to be interviewed. Uh, on camera. And so they had this footage, they then sent, she uh, read some of my writing and sent it down to me, and I could see them trying to have these restorative conversations and see that how, um, what they were trying to reach for in terms of healing and repair, he was trying to reach for in terms of healing and repair what he had done, he had lived with this for 20 years, and so they flew me back and forth from Toronto a few times. And um, so, what ended up happening was we had these restorative conversations around intimate violence, partner violence uh, in the lights of kind of Hollywood. And uh, uh, the, it was really quite something. So it's going to be picked up at, um, Margaret Atwood tweeted it, Arcade Fire, people, and so forth. So it really exploded through the roof. So I, I encourage people to look at that. You can see the trailer online. Thank you.